bookworms. Today I'm here to do my second recent reads video of the year. So the w I've like explained it a couple times, but the way that I'm going to structure things going forward is that I'm going to be wrapping up books every time that I finish a total of five of them. I'll be able to go more in depth about the books that I have to talk to you guys about and hopefully spark some more discussion. I think it'll just be better for everyone overall. So these are books six through ten that I've read so far in 2020. I think I'm actually going to start with my favorite book that I have to talk about from here and that is American Royals by Catherine McGee. I just recently buddy read this book with Heather from Bookables. Oh my god I loved it so much. This book was so addicting. It reimagines American history as if George Washington had accepted the title of king instead of an elected official as the president. So in present day America, which is when this book takes place, we are still being ruled by George Washington's descendants and America is still a monarchy. So this book had a lot of perspectives, but I was so invested in each and every single one of them. Our main characters that we're following are Beatrice, who is the heir to the throne. She's going to be the first queen of America. The reigning royal has always been male. This is the first time in American history that the title is going to be given to a queen who will be the lead ruler of America and she'll have a king consort. So we're following Beatrice who has a lot of pressure on her obviously. Then we're also following her two siblings who are twins. So we have Samantha who is seen as the spare while Beatrice is the heir. And then we also have Samantha's twin brother Jefferson. And Samantha since she is not going Going to be queen and she feels like nobody really cares about what she does. She tends to be a little bit of a troublemaker and she is really talented and really smart but she kind of undervalues herself. And then her twin brother Jefferson, he seems like a nice guy but he had a recent breakup with someone named Daphne and Daphne is determined to get Jefferson back. She wants nothing more than to be a princess of America and she's basically been training her entire life and she will literally do anything that she can to make that happen. And then we're also following Nina who is Samantha's best friend and one of her mothers works for the American monarchy. So she met Jefferson and Sam when she was a lot younger and she's been friends with them for their whole lives. So this book had so many things in it that I loved from royals to romance to imaginary politics to crown jewels to a whole bunch of scandal and drama. American Royals is on the longer side for a book that reads like contemporary. I think it's like 448 pages. So I had been a little bit worried going into it thinking that it was going to take me a while to read, but it totally did not. Like I read this book in two days. I was so in love with it. And while I wasn't reading, I could not stop thinking about what was going on with the characters and what was going to happen next with them once I got like back into their perspective. So I really enjoyed every single perspective in here. Every single time that one of the chapters would end and we would start from someone else's perspective, I would be like, no, I wanted to know what was going to happen next with this character. But then I would get invested in that next thing and be like, oh yeah, I was also really interested in what was going to happen here too. So I feel like that's the sign of a really good book. I am pretty much dying for the second book and this is something that I could definitely see myself rereading in the future, which is a big deal, I would say. I found that Catherine Mickey's writing was really addicting, really readable, and it totally just pulled me in and I just really loved the way that she reimagined things. I thought it was a really fascinating take on America and it did also touch on some of the social issues that we are dealing with as a society today, despite the fact that it's a complete different government. The one thing that bothered me a little bit was some of the miscommunication within the novel. There were a lot of things that could have been solved if people would have just kind of spoken to each other and a couple of misinterpretations interpretations and that is why I didn't give it a full five stars but it was so close for me and I ended up giving it 4.5 stars. Then I read The Duke and I by Julia Quinn and this is the first book in the Bridgerton series. This is a historical romance series. There are a total of eight or nine books. I can't remember now. I think it's nine books. It's really fun because it's following this huge, huge family. I love really big families. I'm so excited to have so many more books that are companions to this and like getting to see where these characters will be in future installments. This is actually only the second historical romance book that I've ever read and I really loved it. As much as I loved the first book in the Wallflower series, I have to say that I definitely loved this book even more. I felt like Julia Quinn's writing was a lot more digestible for me. I 
ended up just flying through it because it was so entertaining. I was definitely wrong about some of the things in here and I was really glad about that because it's very exciting as a reader to find things that are going to surprise you. I think because this is only my second historical romance book I'm not as familiar with like the tropes or story structures that they choose so it's been really fun for me to go into these and really just have no idea what to expect. This is also actually being adapted for Netflix shortly so I'm really excited to watch that adaptation when it comes out though I'm very curious how they are going to handle it. So one thing that I will say about this book is that it was kind of like a historical gossip girl because we start every chapter with gossip column from Lady Whistledown who is telling everybody things that are happening in high society and like all of the gossip and that was a really fun addition to the story. So we're following Daphne who is the oldest sister of the Bridgerton family. So since Daphne grew up with so many brothers a lot of guys just tend to see her as one of the guys instead of viewing her as a woman in her own right. So she tends not to be someone that anyone thinks of romantically despite having a really great personality. So it's been kind of tough for her to find anyone that she might end up potentially marrying. Though she does have some suitors, but she's really looking for a love match. So when Simon, who went to school with her older brother Anthony, comes back into the social scene, his father passes away and he claims the title of Duke. And him and Daphne have a very interesting interesting first run-in and the two of them start like a fake dating relationship at that point to get Daphne's mom off of her back and the two of them obviously end up developing feelings for each other and it was just really fun and really adorable but so I was loving this so much and I was like leaning toward the five star range for it because I thought that it was that good but then somewhere later on in the novel something happens that is like really bad like it's a really not okay situation it was really tough to read and very cringeworthy because you're just like ooh, that's such a bad choice. So despite that, it didn't derail my enjoyment of the entire book. I still obviously think of that moment as a standout of like, ooh, that was bad. But even still, I do still really like the character that made that decision and I still love the story overall. And I still found it to be very readable, very enjoyable. And I'm very much looking forward to reading the next books because I've heard that this one is actually the weakest of the series and that sounds like it bodes really well because I loved it so if they keep getting better from here I can't even imagine how much I'm gonna love the next books. And I ended up giving this one four stars. Next I read Followers by Megan Angelo. So I was very attracted to this book because of the premise and basically we are following two characters in New York City in 2015-2016 but it's dual timeline so then we're also following a character named Marlo in 2051 in a closed community in California. So in 2015 we're following Orla and Floss. Orla is an aspiring young writer and Floss is is someone that is basically just dying to be famous and the two of them end up kind of cheating the system and and working toward getting Floss to achieve that fame. Meanwhile in 2051 we're following Marlo who lives in a closed community in California and in 2051 every single person who is a celebrity is like a government appointed celebrity and they're referred to as influencers. They spend their entire life on camera and from, like from the moment that they're born until the moment that they're no longer working out for the network they have everything just on screen and they also have like endorsement deals so some of them have to advertise like fashion things some of them have to advertise vitamins and Marlo is actually in charge of advertising for a drug that helps people get their emotions under control and I just thought the whole premise of having to live your life completely on camera to be so fascinating because these are people who don't even totally understand the implications that go into putting everything out there so publicly and from the moment that they're Born, they just are on camera so they don't know anything different. There are a couple of areas that are private like they can't be filmed when they're in the bathroom or if they're in like a dressing room or something but during that time they get a notification like in their ear that tells them how many followers they're losing by being off camera and it advises them to go back to a public space like as soon as possible. And the influencers are also assigned different storylines so despite the fact that something might not actually be going on they have to make make it go on in order to keep the audience entertained. I will say that this book was a wild, 
wild ride. I really enjoyed learning about an event called The Spill, which is kind of hinted at in the beginning of the book, but you don't really get too much confirmation on what actually happened until much later in the novel. This book had some incredibly unbelievable storylines, and it also showed just how far some people will go to stay in the public eye. I have to say that I did not like a single character in this novel. Like, not one of them was someone that I would ever want to, like, be friends with at all, but that didn't really bother me since I went into it more for the premise. But since I did feel so disconnected from all of the protagonists, it did hinder my enjoyment of the story overall. So I am glad that the book got me to think more critically about the influencer industry and a very scary place that things could potentially be headed in the future, just the way that people are addicted to phones and social media now. But unfortunately, it was definitely not a new favorite for me. I do think that this would be a good book for book clubs because there will definitely be a lot of discussion about things that impact our everyday lives. But overall it was kind of medium for me and I ended up giving this one three stars. Next I read Quiet by Susan Cain. This is a book that I've been wanting to read forever because I am a self-proclaimed introvert. It really helped give me a deeper understanding of the character traits that introverts possess. My sister-in-law Molly actually gave me a copy of this book for Christmas so thank you Molly and I as you can see prioritized it and made it a January read. Quiet provides a very in-depth look at what constitutes an introvert versus an extrovert, and it looks a lot at nature versus nurture, which is something that I've always found to be really interesting. It also examines the way that people get to certain places, like there's not just one way to, to become an introvert. You could potentially be born that way, but your surroundings could also influence you to have more introverted traits. I would say that my biggest takeaway from this book is that it completely redefined the meaning of the word sensitive for me because I never considered myself to be a sensitive person even though lately I do feel like I cry like every time I read a book or watch a movie but like personally if someone says something mean to me I that doesn't bother me. But I want to just read a quote that I pulled from it about being sensitive because it is like 100% me and I was not expecting to ever think of myself as a sensitive person until I read this. So it says, highly sensitive people tend to be keen observers who look before they leap. They arrange their lives in ways that limit surprises. They're often sensitive to sights, sounds, smells, pain, and coffee, and highly sensitive people also process information about their environments, both physical and emotional, unusually deeply. They tend to notice subtleties that others miss, another person's shift in mood, say, or a light bulb burning a touch too brightly. So this is totally, totally me. Like, I am extremely sensitive my, to my surroundings at all times. Like, my family makes fun of me because I can't ever, like, sleep on public transportation because I need to know what everyone else is doing, or if that, like, there's the potential for any Thing to change or like a dangerous situation to arise. And I also need time to like mentally adjust to planning things. Like if I'm going, travel is really what gives me the most anxiety. So if I have to go anywhere, like even if it's just a train ride away, I need like notice so that I can get in the mindset of doing that. Planning things in a way that limits surprises is oh my gosh, like when I'm going somewhere and I Google map it, I write down every single little detail from like whether I should exit the subway on like the northwest or northeast corner so that I know exactly what I'm doing. So that was just like super spot on for me. So while I do agree with a lot of what Susan Cain wrote and a lot of what's in here, I do also think that it is difficult to classify people as only one of two things. I do think that there are still some other variables to consider and I know that you can be like a certain percentage in introverted versus extroverted, but nonetheless it was really fascinating. I think one of my favorite parts about the book is that it really celebrated introversion and the qualities that introverts possess because our society really does tend to celebrate extroverts, but introverted people are also really important to society and they tend to have really good ideas and tend to be more cautious about what they're doing. They don't take as big of risks, so we do need people like that to strike a balance. I generally enjoyed the whole book, but there were a couple of things that didn't really apply to me so I thought that they were valuable to read anyway but like the chapter on raising introverted children like didn't really do much for me so I ended up giving quiet four stars and then last book 
book that I read is Good Girls Lie by J.T. Allison. This is a boarding school thriller novel, so obviously that's something that I would be picking up. I ended up picking up a copy because it was the January pick of the month for the Bad on Paper podcast, which I really enjoy listening to. I've been trying to read some of the books that they are focusing on so that I can listen to the episodes where they discuss them, and it was actually really funny. While I was listening to the episode that wrapped this book up, they announced that their February pick is Followers, which I happened to be in the middle of at the time when I was listening, so that worked out really well for me. So I've been wanting to read more thrillers, so I thought this was a good opportunity to pick one up that was new and that I hadn't really heard much about, but unfortunately it didn't really work for me. They kept saying that it's a young adult novel, but I really think this is an adult novel and it does have YA crossover appeal. We aren't only following students, we're also following some adults and the way that it's written felt more adult to me than young adult. So it takes place at a prestigious all-girls boarding school in Virginia. We're following a whole bunch of perspectives and there's not always a clear indication of whose perspective we're getting. So sometimes you have to read like a couple of paragraphs before you can pull context clues to know who it is. So so the book starts with the start of the school year and the boarding school has just received a new student named Ash and Ash has kind of a strange past in the sense that she interviewed and everything and then in the time from being accepted to the school to actually coming and like physically going there to start the semester, she's lost both of her parents and we get to see how mean some girls can be in high school. I think there was a bit more bullying than I had anticipated that there would be. Ash also keeps alluding to the fact that she's trying to distance herself from whatever it was that just happened to her in her recent past. And then bodies kind of start surfacing at good, so there's a couple of things happen to different students. The beginning half of the novel read really slowly because we're learning all of the exposition about the characters and about the school and about the different families and all of their statuses at good, which is the name of the school. Honestly, I felt like this was a really slow build until about like 75% into the novel and that's when things really picked up. One element of the book that I really liked is that there are secret societies within this school, so I thought that was fun because I did really like that movie like Skulls when I watched it a lot of years ago. I'm really looking forward to reading Ninth House now because I still haven't done that and I really think that I'm gonna love Ninth House and I think that this one just wasn't for me. I think that your enjoyment level of this book will depend on how familiar you are with thriller tropes and how you feel about specific ones. I obviously don't want to spoil anything, but this particular trope just really doesn't work for me. I didn't DNF the book because I wanted to read the full thing for the book club episode and I also really love boarding school settings so that kind of is what kept me going but overall it was pretty lackluster and I ended up giving it 2.5 stars. So those were the next five books that I read in January and February. Let me know if you read anything that I mentioned or if you have any recommendations for me because I really want to read some more thrillers but that one was really disappointing so I need to like get a good palette cleanser and like pick something else up really soon. But that's all that I have for this video so I will see you guys soon in a new one. Bye!